behaves to let a couple people take a shot at shooting the burger strike. So if y'all will join us outside in just a moment. <coughs> and we're, we're shooting National Park Service approved. If I'm not speaking loud enough, wave your hand or something and I'll try and speak up. I am going to ask that everybody stay on this half of the road because I'm going to kind of aim at that crepe myrtle as I fire and I don't want anybody getting into the cone. All right, we try and keep the 60 degree cone clear. So I'm going to aim to the left of that tree just a little bit. So let's stay away from that tree. Brian, I was going to suggest somebody as a target. What we're going to be firing is I'm going to start off with the brown bat. Yes, I'm going to clean two fire locks for this demo. But when we go to shoot the Ferguson, we actually have to load it. And we're going to be using National Park Service approved, approved Ferguson demonstration ammo, or what we lovingly refer to as Fergie Ball. This is wet toilet paper that's been compressed in a 625 caliber mold, allowed to dry and dipped once in wax. If I've done it correctly, they will turn to confetti after I pull the trigger. If I have not, we may hear one ding off a passing car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to show you the King's Arm Brown Best first so you understand what a difference. Step out a little further so everybody can see. I was going to try and keep the shape, but that ain't going to work. I still got my line. I'm going to show you loading the Brown Best musket. Does someone have a watch capable of timing one minute? A second hand or a stopwatch. All right. I'm going to start loading. Half cock, open pan, handle cartridge, bite cartridge, prime pan, shut pan, cast about, charge with cartridge, seat ball, ram down cartridge, recover rammer, return rammer. I'm going to go through all of those steps every time. If you can give me a countdown when you want me to start the one minute, the one minute will start when I fire the first round. You can go any time. Okay. Fire in the hole! Woo. Twenty seconds gone or twenty seconds left? Twenty seconds <laughs> total left between chucks. Oh, okay. Dude, that was a little slower. That was about twenty-five. <laughs> you stopped the timer. <laughs> best. That's not a carbine. Okay. I'm a little faster with a carbine. So you can see all the permutations, juggling and, and galley wagon that goes, that's getting hot. That goes into loading a standard muzzle loading firearm. If you got it loaded with a lead ball, yes. If you got it loaded with a lead ball, it's basically a stiff 12 gauge. But it's a slow stiff 12 gauge. If that makes sense. Now, if you don't think that's a, a smart way to fight a war, imagine 150 guys standing shoulder to shoulder doing that. Now, keep in mind, the ground bass is not a firearm. The ground bass is a transport and delivery mechanism for a bayonet. <laughs> you and I are going to close, and I'm going to faint at your throat with my brown bass. And you're going to try and parry my bayonet to the side. And when you do, your left elbow is going to come up. The man to my right is now going to ignore you and stab you in the armpit, puncturing your lung, severing the brachial artery, possibly severing your heart. I'm ignoring you, and I kill you. And the British Army goes through your line like a 
threshing machine. That's how the British Army conquered the world. Not by shooting. Alright, I'm going to take a fouling shot with my Ferguson before we start this. And then I'm going to load my ammunition uh, magazine, stick ball in my cheek, and see. Now, some historians have said that Ferguson's needed a special brass tool for loading. We found that our issue, by God, Ferguson loading tool works just fine. <laughs> and you'll find Ferguson shooters bearing their Fergie finger with pride. Shooting a lead ball is not really hard to get it in because of the weight of the lead. So these paper balls have no weight. Alright, I'm gonna fire one fouling shot. Was there a pre-made cartridge like with the brown bass for the for the Ferguson? Ferguson would have loaded loose ball glued in paper. Um, whether Ferguson made some ball that were in cartridges, where the cartridges were all, the ball were always carried loose. We don't know. He didn't write it down. Um, we know that we can successfully load and, and meet Ferguson seven rounds a minute, both loading with paper cartridges and loose ball, and loading with loose ball and a horn. We know Ferguson ordered powder flasks of some kind for his rifles. We don't know what they were, because they're not described in, in the uh, inventory. We think probably a spring valve type um, horn, like is sometimes assumed to be the light infantry horn, or sometimes called an artillery horn. So you reckon that type of horn. And the reason gives you about 75 grains into your chamber. When you close the chamber, if you compress 67 grain load, you didn't seven need grains of powder for the pan. This is a larger caliber than the Decker type. Yes, a Decker rifle is typically what the British would consider a sub man stopping caliber. Anything less than 62 caliber is for game, not men. Decker rifles were typically in the 40 caliber range. 62. Oh, yeah, I can't. Oh, yeah. Cheeky also, fellow. when you uh, <laughs> actually stop to aim, you shoot a wild ball, you do seven and shoot blanks from the crop, you shoot it the target, <laughs> yeah, I get about five aim shots. Okay, ready to time? Hold up. Ready to time? I got to get rid of every time I load and I still got five rifle shots off in a minute. Now trying to shoot seven rounds a minute, you're not aiming. But Ricky was able to get five shots a minute off at 100 yards aimed under one minute. The sixth shot just took him to one minute and 20 seconds. At the Southeastern National Primitive Rendezvous last year, we did this demonstration on the range. And we were shooting at an 8 inch diameter steel gong at about 75 yards. Ricky hit the gong every single time. Now, do we have 
some folks who would be interested in an opportunity in firing a blank out of a Ferguson rifle. All right. <laughs> Yeah, one thing when you do shoot, you want to grab either Ricky's hat or mine and pull it down. The Ferguson does vent slightly at the breech. It won't hurt you, it won't burn you, but it will surprise you. So the fire comes out counterclockwise out of the top of that breech. You've got a wide rim hat that fits. Don't ask me how many. Uh, if anybody would like to see uh, my almost seven shots a minute run, we have it on the uh, Ready? computer right inside the door. Kind of fun tonight. Pretty natural, I had. See how long my how long my flint holds out. She's real addicted to shoot. Twenty shots is a flint foot When we could get good black English flint, I could get sixty more shots out of a single flint. The stuff that the guy is selling now is actually from the coal pile. <laughs> Designed by a rifleman. <laughs> of the two of us, Ricky has the smallest. <laughs> As my mother is fond of telling me, I was born in that size.
one thing we neglected to mention to you, you guys are familiar with the Paoli Massacre? When Matt Anthony, when they uh, took the flints out of the fire locks and took out the Americans, in the records of one of the British officers there, it's noted that the American sentries were silenced by the riflemen with their sword bayonets. The last thing seen by the sentries at the Battle of Paoli was a Ferguson rifle coming in. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I've been uh, following these uh, uh, symposium for about. This is 10 years, so I've been watching it for about 10 years now. About this is my first chance to actually be at one because either being deployed or out of the area in other forms, I've not been able to get my schedule lined up. But again, y'all got the bow. But I'd like to thank George and Carol for having us today and everyone else. I'd like to mention my wife Valerie, she's from Atlanta. So all this talk about Henri Georgians all day long <laughs> has really confirmed some of my other suspicions. <laughs> I will throw out a quick plug of, of, of just pure raw capitalism. There is a book coming out, uh, The Swamp Fox Lessons in Leadership from the Partisan Campaigns of Francis Marion under the uh, University of Naval, I'm sorry, the Naval Institute Press out of Maryland picked up that title. So that should be out around about the uh, 15th of November, uh, Good Lord Bullen and the Creek Don't Rise on that one. But what I have done and how I've looked at Marion all started back when I was about 13 years old. Picture the Donaldson Branch of the Nashville Public Library. A little kid, real skinny, is walking through the biographies. He's in M, looks up, and there is Epstein and Williams, Francis Marion, and uh, Swamp Fox of the Revolution. And for me, it's been a lifetime of journey since after I pulled that book down, I think I read it in one setting, and it's been that way ever since. So I did have kind of a, a side um, sideshow as I went kind of through the uh, you know some of the campaigns I've been with in the global war on terrorism, particularly in Iraq. And, and you, in, in a counterinsurgency, there's good days and bad days, no matter how good you are. And in some days that were less good than others for me, I would be sitting in camp at the end of a long day of death and destruction and think to myself, wow, I think I just got swamp boxed on that day. So <laughs> again, depending on uh, which end of the muzzle you're facing, uh, you can sometimes you know, learn, you will always learn, but sometimes better than others on that. Again, as I've, I've looked at, at, at uh, Marion and I've analyzed his campaign, I've done it really from a contemporary military standpoint. So I know, and we'll talk a little bit on um, Fort, Fort Mott and fire, and some of the thoughts on how exactly fire reached the roof of Fort Mott. Well, from my perspective is, no matter how it got there, I look at it from the fact that General Marion was using innovative tactics, and how does that apply to me today? How does that apply to my men today? And although we do go through and talk a lot about military history, in our military professional education program and training programs are constantly ongoing, I think that there is a shortcoming in that. And for instance, the uh, firearms demonstration that we just had, I can tell you of my NCOs inside of the Marine Corps, probably one or two out of 10 has seen something like that before. But yet these are men who have been under fire in Iraq or Afghanistan probably twice. So although they can react to what they need to react to when the bullets are flying from them at that time, to have a larger appreciation of how warfare has evolved through the, through the years and through the ages is something just slightly beyond the reach at this time. That's something I think we as American military uh, need to do a little bit better on. So again, let's go ahead and uh, start the journey here. Some of the topics that I've laid out there are uh, listed as shown. I'll go into specifics on all of the top well, it's the top bullet, the tactics of Marion, A, they're well known, and B, they'll kind of come out through the rest of the uh, presentation. Now, one thing I would like to bring your attention to is uh, terminology. 
Partisan, irregular, guerrilla, guerrilla warfare. I've got all the definitions written down here in my, uh, in my, looks like Sanskrit that I've written in. But really, right now, the Department of Defense uh, Dictionary, which is like the dictionary I have, you reach for a Webster's, I reach for the DOD Dictionary, and that's kind of my vernacular. We, right now, we being the DOD, do not use the term partisan at this time. I don't know why, but we call it irregular, we talk guerrilla, we talk everything else. So I'm going to stick with guerrilla and uh, use that as uh, kind of uh, as a synonym for partisan. I think technically there are a couple of changes, but again, as I'm looking at it from my perspective, you know, what does Marion do for me right now in the day-to-day -day prosecution of, of military conflict? Well, irregular, partisan, and guerrilla, I'm just going to kind of keep them together for the purposes of today. The There's my theme that, I, again, I brought up. And again, as you can see here, not only for the military leaders, but the political leaders as well. And particularly with counterinsurgencies and with some of the campaigns that we've seen, it leads uh, the fact that the military and the politicians need to be hand in hand in prosecuting an end state. And you see that in Joe Marion's time, and you see that today in our time. Um, some more historical things that I have, and I have a map here, or a, 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 a a, uh, a slide here in two slides that I'll show you that talks about the years that I've concentrated on, which I think are action packed to say the least. But again, you know, there it is. You have uh, Joe Marion kind of controlling things themselves, doing the best they can to keep the British uh, from the nowhere from succumbing to British control uh, between those time frames. And then, of course, upon the arrival of Green's Continental Army in the area, then Marion reverted in part to a, a very supporting role uh, for the duration. Okay, this slide here, the only good thing about this blob right there is the fact that I drew it. That's about the only thing that I think is good about it. But what I've tried to outline is some of the key points. And I have characterized Matt Marion's actions. You know, for me, I, I look at the battles he participated in at Utah Springs and uh, Quimby. I look at them and then I look at kind of how he did what I refer to as positional warfare that I'll talk on in a moment and that deals everything with forts. And then I look at the engagements which are kind of everything else. Well, you know, both actions in and around Georgetown and then all throughout the area. And then I also kind of, I know that the skirmishes are out there, but I kind of draw a line between, you know, just the day-to-day -day skirmishing that would take place, scouting, things of that nature, and some of the larger engagements. So people may call it a battle that I would call an engagement, but again, it's just from my mind how I kind of uh, draw the line. But again, you do see um, the area around in here is really kind of what I focused on, but obviously, you know, he was important up to the very end. And then, of course, you know, I kind of book in, uh, some of the larger events there for folks to see with Charleston capturing three on either side. So again, I kind of focus on uh, this part here with Marion in particular and, you know, kind of his relationship because what I turned to his Green's campaign to uh, uh, recover the South and kind of the, the, the dates on that. Colonel, do you I regard... Think, I'm sorry? Quick question. Do you regard the uh, battle signified in black as draws? <laughs> Is that why you have them in black? Is there draws? In other words, uh, there's no clear winner? Yes, sir. You, you, are, you are correct. And, and, and again, for me, it's, it's a timeline. Uh, you know, like for instance, you call springs, you know. I, right now, the way I look at things, I say Utah Springs is definitely a victory. But when you look at the numbers and then when you look at what people say and the technicalities of who owns the battle and things of that nature, the build of battle and things, that's, you know, it gets, in my mind, squishy. So one thing I've seen with, with all of this is, you know, looking at something in isolation, you need to kind of, you know, take it, okay, got it, and then, and, and then move on. But um, uh, for, for definite, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I got a little bit of cow pit, um, uh, uh, York County on the brain because I'm going up there Friday, the good Lord willing, the creek don't rise. So, you know, I'm kind of look, and I look upon that slide, I see Yorktown by mistake in, in some instances, but that's kind of how I have this uh, laid out. And I did not describe that well, and I probably should have. Sir. 
I think y'all just saw that. But, uh, again, Marion's leadership uh, is something that I've used as an example, uh, probably not as much as me as, as articulating to other folks and trying to get them to obviously be better leaders, particularly military leaders. There's been several military contemporary leader um, models that are out there, and I've compared Marion to those, and there's the leadership principles uh, that the Marines use. Uh, one that, that I will use here in a moment is uh, one by uh, a British officer that I'll talk to in a moment, a modern, more modern British officer. I put this in because I just like it. I mean, this, this is something here as I kind of, as I start to think about General Merritt as a leader, I start looking at that, and there's just so much in that one paragraph that uh, this was in his uh, Memories of the War by, by Life Horse Ferry. There's just so much in that paragraph, I don't think there's a single word in there that's wasted. It's just action-packed, wow, of all the things that, that he did. And I go through, you know, in greater detail and, and, and can discuss this offline is how I think about some of this goes, you know, furlough and strategy and things of that nature, nothing mercenary. I mean, you know, I think by and large, the general has um, done quite well in the scrutinies of time. I know that when the Patriot came out, there was some folks from the other side of the pond started to throw things out there about Marion, and I know particularly in one instance, the raping of slave women. Well, I don't know where that came from. It was, if it's written down somewhere and then somebody show it to me, no, okay, I'll agree with them, but I think it's just really people pulling uh, facts out of their backside from time to time. So I think, personally, Joe Marion's character is good. I think back in the old day, he was a good man. I think he had to go fight because he had to go fight, and I think he had some dirty tricks up his sleeve when he was fighting, but in war, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. That's just the way that it is, and that's why we, and the biggest difference between the Marines and the Boy Scouts is A, the Boy Scouts have better adult supervision, and B, the Marines are able to conduct uh, dirty tricks and get away with it. So again, you know, when you're talking about people dying, you know, hey, the gloves come off. So again, I think from time to time you'll read people begrudgingly give uh, Joe Marion uh, some degree of credit, begrudgingly, and others will throw a few stones at him, but again, I think that his shield is strong enough to keep those stones at bay. So I just really, really, really like uh, this uh, quick descriptor of his uh, his character. To go on any further, uh, General J.F.C. Fuller wrote a book in 1936. Uh, it's up there for you. I, I look at generalship, not necessarily the guy that wears stars, but the guy and that's the military leader of his organization. And in that case, generalship, it's diseases in their cure state of personal factor in command. This was written by J.F.C. Fuller of the British Army after, as his view of kind of senior leadership in World War I. The guys were way back, pick up the phone, say, charge. The guys get up out of the uh, trenches, move forward in the, in the machine guns uh, to pretty poor effect. So I think he was somewhat sickened by that. But what he did, he pulls out the three pillars of generalship that what he sees courage, creative intelligence, and physical fitness. And he again attributes it to the youth rather than of middle age. His uh, optimum ages are 35 to 45 for five as a leader, 35 to 45. Uh, Marion at the time was 48 when he started uh, his, his campaign. Uh, going through this, courage. It's, it's somewhat self-explanatory as a descriptor. There are definitions specifically inside of some of the leader manuals. But things that I saw with Marion that strike me as fancy is he wasn't the biggest, he wasn't the strongest. He placed himself in a position with his forces to where he command and control. The things that I've noticed time and time again is Marion was at the right place at the right time, but he wasn't necessarily engaged in personal combat, but he could control his people. He's the one that allows the forces to remain forces and not become rival, not to become a mob, to remain functional in a military sense. Very, very, very unique position, a very modern perspective in where to be. He also, uh, again, uh, 
one thing of note in as his uh, men came up and were trying to cross the river, the the the, 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 the books that you you read and, and the things about Marion is the fact that you know it's reportedly that he could not swim yet he would take his horse, get off, and take, lead it and go into the river first, to allow his men to come with him to cross the river. So again, I don't know about you, I don't mind scuba diving. But to scuba dive and have something over my head other than water gives me the heebie-jeebies. So like going into a wreck or something, I won't do that. So I can kind of relate to Marion with the fact that, hey, I don't like to get that water, but you got to do what you got to do. So in my mind, you know, he stands very tall in the area of courage. Creative intelligence. We have all met. You will walk into a room. The smartest person in that room doesn't have enough sense to water shotgun. <laughs> They're smart, but they can't apply their common. They can't apply it in a common sense. In my mind, creative intelligence, based off of Fuller's descriptor, is the fact of you're smart, but you can use your smarts to the common good or to achieve your goals. If you look at ideas such as using fire to combat Fort Mott, using a mayhem power to combat Fort Watson, that shows creative intelligence. And it's much more, I think, than just the, okay, we got it, we're in a swampy area, we need to make sure we make good use of the ambush, which of course he did, and that's just, uh, I can go down that trail for quite a ways. Also with creative intelligence, truce is that he was allowed and that he instituted amongst the Tories. I mean, you can shoot Tories and take them off the field, or you can also, if with favorable terms, create a truce and take them off the field. Obviously, you save a little bit, a little bit of gunpowder doing the second. You also lead into what we refer to as conflict termination, which I'll talk to in a moment, so I'll leave it there. But also, the thing in moving on quickly to physical fitness, again, Marion was a little older than the optimum age that uh, Fuller has laid down. And of course, Fuller went back with his research to Caesar and, and uh, folks like that. But, uh, you know, Marion, bad, bad foot, bad, bad ankle. Uh, left Charleston, thankfully for us. But if you notice Marion and look at his staying power, time and time again, either through wounds or through disease, most of the common names that we talk about in this area during the American Revolution, they're bedridden or they're taken out of action for one reason or another. Sickness, uh, injury, sometimes death, now they'll obviously do it a permanent factor. But with Marion, from start to finish on that diagram I showed, he was out there, he was at time in and time out. So again, in a, in a counterinsurgency, you know, it goes on, it goes on, it goes on, God, you wish it would end, it just keeps on going. And he had to stay in power. So in my mind, the fact that he's a little older, okay, I got it, we'll give him waivers. Hey, you know, he was physically fit for what he needed to do for this particular campaign. So I think in viewing him through that leadership model, the, the Fuller's leadership model, I think Marion stands up in fine, fine.